Good afternoon, I'm Terry Topcat for Terry Topcat Presents for ColossalView.com and I'm with the wonderful, inspiring and very cool Guy Holmes. Good afternoon Guy, how oh, are you doing? Thank you very much, that's, for, that's a very nice description. Oh, it's um, lovely to see you. I'm wearing a sweater to try and warm up, not to be so cool. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of met you, God, about, well, about 30 something years ago and I came for an interview with you when you had the wonderful record label Gut Records, but we're going to start about your history and where you started. So you, when, before we started the interview, you said that you left school and you started working at EMI Records. Yeah, I, I got expelled from school at 16. It was the third school I'd been expelled from. I, I have very bad dyslexia. So uh, in my days, school told you you were just stupid. And, and, and I'm like, right, fine. You know, and I couldn't read and write very well. Certainly couldn't uh, uh, pass exams. So, um, but what, I, what luckily I'd started doing when I was 14 was buying records and DJing. And, um, and and I was DJing at various places, and you know, obviously school disco is. What would you as, play? So. Oh, mainly soul and funk, man. I mean, yeah. I was a big soul Great. and funk fan, and too, if it yeah. if it had a if it had a rhythm and a beat, and it was black, it was mine. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I, I mean, all of that stuff because there was you know, if you were Parliament, Earth, Wind and Fire, Funkadelic. Um, you know, all the McFadden greats. and Whitehead, and you know, just any of those groups. Motown and yeah, M Motown, Philly was up Sound, there. And, yeah. yeah, Stevie, obviously, bar, bar none. Uh, I bought. I mean, I used to queue up. There was a, 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 a an import shop called Groove Records in Greek Street in, I in well, and I yeah. used to queue up on Thursdays and Saturdays when the import van arrived, so I could have it off there, like get something like the Multicolored T Connection 12 inch, you know, and, and I had to have that piece of vinyl. Uh, and and you know that was that was my addiction, uh, thank goodness. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, and I didn't buy clothes; I bought music, and I'd have every single current seven inch. I'd have every single twelve inch. I mean, I was just mad for it. Uh, and dance music was my thing uh, in those days. And um, I had a moment when I left school where I, I was supposed to go to technical college, and, and that wasn't good. And so I had a got into a bit of a bit of a row with someone, and, and, and landed up walking down Oxford, walking up and down Oxford Street with no money in my pocket. I was earning nothing, forty quid a week. I think I was earning. And um, something overcame me, and I walked into Reed's Employment Agency in Oxford Street, walked up to the right behind the desk, and said, um, "I want a job in the music business." We laughed. <laughs> for obvious reasons. <laughs> Who's this fucking idiot? You know, and um, he said, "All right, give me your phone number. Give me that." And he said, "So, what are your qualifications?" I said, oh, I've got seven O levels, you know, GCSE type <laughs> things. I don't have any. Um, and uh, and three weeks later, he rang me up. He said, "I've got I've got you an interview at United Artists. It's part, you know, United Artists Records uh, on Mortimer Street." And I went, "Oh." He said, "There's a problem." I said, "What's that?" He said, um, "He said, well, they're looking for a 19 to 23 year old, and you're only 17." But I've told him you're 19. So I'm sitting there thinking. Well, that's the lie of... There's two lies in there. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. So I go for the interview and, 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 that, and interviewed a couple of times. And at the last interview, I'm sitting there thinking, right, which of these porky pies can <laughs> I get away with? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so the, I said to the bloke, I said, because I'm thinking he's going to want to look at my driving lines because, you know, it's junior in the sales office. Um, and, I'm doing, you know, uh, they want me to do the figures and all sorts of... I can't do figures for shit. And, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so I've said to the bloke, I said... Well, uh, I'm actually only 17. And he went, he went, well, you fooled me. Yeah. And, and very, very luckily, yeah, I got a job as a postboy, gopher, sales office assistant, whatever you want to call it, at United Artists. And who was there at the time? Oh, shit, it? man. That was the Stranglers and the Buzzcocks oh, and wow. the Vapors. I think I'm turning, Jack. Yeah, I love that. Um, Jerry Rafferty, you know, all that kind of yeah. stuff. And it was great. And the Stranglers were my heroes. Uh, and they were really, really, really my heroes. I mean, I was, I was playing Rats Navigicus in school. I'll say no more heroes, still heroes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rats yeah. Navigicus, no more heroes anymore. And, and Stranglers were like, pfft, you know, they, they were really, really something I loved. So, um, and I'd been there about a year, and, I, and I, I noticed that the people who did radio and TV promotion were lazy. <laughs> and they just didn't get in the office. They got in the office at 10.30 in the morning. I mean, I'm in at, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning latest. And you're there till 7 or 8 at night. You do what you do. And I'm, these guys are going home at 5.30 and getting in at 10.30. And, I'm, and also, you know, they've had the sauce. And I'm thinking... <laughs> I mean, 18, I mean, stupid, obviously, but I'm thinking I could do a better job than them. And, and there's a degree of arrogance and ignorance going into that. And so I, I went to the marketing director and asked for a job in the plugging department. And he looked at me and he went, no. And I went, well, why? He went, because you're too young. He said, the average age of producers at Radio One's 35. How are you going to talk to them? I went, well, 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 we can talk to them. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> so uh, long story short, there was a lovely man called Mickey Most, 
Who's the the, Mickey Mouse? Yeah, the Mickey Mouse. Wow. And he owned Rack Records and That's Rack right. Studios. And, and EMI distributed Rack in those days. And EMI, went on, EMI distribution went on strike. And Rack Records got converted into a warehouse. Mickey converted one of the studios into a warehouse. And I got the job amongst, with a couple of other people, Jackie and Pat and so on, of picking and packing records. So, and there was a record out by Hot Chocolate called No Doubt About It. Oh, and I think, so, yeah. memory says it went to number two. And then Mickey and his brother Dave, his brother Dave was a promotion man, lovely man, um, took us to the pub to thank us. And I'm sitting there like this, I'm saying, it's like you're going to start to sit with Simon Cowell today, you know, as a kid. You're <laughs> nervous as anything, because this is, you know, he's God. Yeah. And he's having more hits than God. Did he have and Susie Quattro on yeah, the name? Yeah, all yeah, those, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. with everything. Yeah. You know, but pop, out now, yeah. pop. And, uh, and Mickey and Dave very sweetly said to me, so what do you want to do? And I went, I really want to be a promotion man, but they've told me I'm too young. And uh, I didn't think anything more of it. You know, that's all I said. Um, and then a, about a week later, the manager director of EMI calls me up. Cliff, great man. He calls me up and says, get your fucking ass up here. <laughs> so was, oh, shit, I've done something wrong. And I walked into his office and he went, right, Monday morning, you're a promotion man. You've got friends in high places. And Mickey had called the chairman of EMI. Oh, and said, I like this kid, I think you should. And that was, you know, thank you, God. Yeah. You know, that was the luck. Um, and then I start as a plugger, as a promotion man. I'm 18, just, just, just 18. And I start. And say how it was different back then, because now, you know, this is pre internet. Uh, and was it payola as well? No, you, no, there no, wasn't no, no, payola, no, no, so it was no, pure no, no, no. If promotion. It, if it had been that, I would never have done it, because right. that's not what it's about. So it's about the music. And it's about your ability to be able to, to listen to a piece of music and know that it's good enough. And then your relationship. Because if I come and see you every week and I lie to you, yeah. why are you going to trust me? Exactly. Yeah, if I can't keep coming into your office and playing your rubbish records, <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to go, you're, you're going to go yeah, thank you very much, yeah, go yeah, away. Yeah. If I keep walking in your record, in, 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 into your office and playing you great records, you're going to listen to me. And you're going to play my records. And that's the skill. Can you pick a hit? It's the skill in the music business. You can't define it, you can't teach it, you can't you know, say A equals C equals D, because it doesn't. You either have that intuition or you don't. And I've tried over many years teaching it to kids and I can't. They've either got it in them or they haven't. And, and I've got a bunch of my ex-juniors who now run all the major record labels and they're good kids and they've got that skill. They can listen to 100 bits of music and go, that one. Yeah, it's the it's the secret sauce. You know, it's the X factor. Dare I say it? Yeah. Um, and it's the bit that's in the business. So if you're a producer at Radio One or Capital or anywhere, and I, I, I build a relationship with you based on trust and based on the fact that the music I bring you is really good, and then occasionally you're going to walk in with a record that's difficult. Um, I would say something like Robert White Ship Building or Julian Cope, uh, World Shut Your Mouth were two records I worked songs, on, though. I love which I songs. loved, yeah. which were tough to get away. Right, yeah. Julian Cope took me 11 weeks of just gently nudging at people before it clicked and went. And Robert Wyatt was one of those. I just walked into people and I needed a break because it was just the most beautiful but non-pop record. I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, and, but a beautiful, extraordinary, haunting, special piece of music. Got to number two, didn't it? Or something? Uh, top five, I think. I can't. You know, I wish I could remember. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I think six or seven. I don't think yeah. it was that high. Um, but it was special. And, and you just, because if we hadn't been doing U2 at the time and all the other bits and pieces that went with it, we wouldn't have had the momentum. Yeah. For them to trust us to give us a break, so that was that was the difference, um, and, and you had to look at you know the bands had to be great. So you went from EMI. So when did you go from EMI to Island Records? Oh shit! Well EMI, so EMI, I was very lucky. I, I, I broke a band called Duran Duran. That was Love my first Duran big Duran. one. Um, you still in touch with them now? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so yeah, I, I great did, band. I did him a sign a few weeks ago. Yeah, too. they're he's brilliant. Fantastic. He's lovely. I and then making and now well, he's going to be recording with Andy Taylor. Yeah, I well, really and he's been over to Andy. Andy's not been. Yeah, uh, bless uh, him, yeah, yeah. Blessed, yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, Simon's very special. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not a pop star person. I don't. Have, I don't keep loads of. I don't have friends in the music business. He was my first. He used yeah. to come around to my mum and dad's house for Sunday lunch. Oh, that's nice. Um, and we've been mates ever yeah. since. And, and he's just a very lovely human being. Um, and because that's what it's about. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I did do that, and then I did well. The, the, one of the loveliest things was I got to do Golden Brown for the Stranglers. One, uh, one oh of the wow! Other, How special was that for you? Um, Crawford, the, yeah. the model. Um, mm. Talk, talk. Um, Thomas Dolby. So they were the one, some of the things I did while I was at EMI. And luckily, 
that that gave me the opportunity to to then move on to other, a couple of other labels came in to a bunch of people came and offered us a job and I really liked EMI but they they wouldn't pay me any more money because it was thorny in my corporate policy till I was I don't know 25 or 23 or something silly that I couldn't earn any more than I was earning they said I'll give you a better car and I'm like no, <laughs> that's not fair, because <laughs> yeah. it's about fairness. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm earning yeah. them as much money as the other people, so why shouldn't yeah, I exactly. have a fair wage? Um, so luckily, um, I, worked, I spent a minute at Arista. I did Thompson Twins, Haircut 100, <gasps> The Beats, oh, um, okay. uh, Dion Warwick, things like that, which were great. And, but the best one was Aretha Franklin, Jump To It. That was, that oh, was the best yeah, record I, I got to work song. there. Yeah. That was proper tune. And, and for me, as a, as a song. Re- yeah, exactly. Yeah, Aretha. Will Aretha was a special thing. The saddest bit was she wouldn't get on the plane and come and promote no, it. Otherwise, we'd have had a much bigger hit. Yeah. Just jumped to it. I thought it was a special piece of music. Um, and then I got approached by the best independent plugging company, a um, chap called Clive Banks, who's still a friend. He's fantastic. And From, he had yeah, I'd, Modern I'd, I'd, Media was yeah, a company. Yeah. And we, they had... Um, the Jam to the Style Council, Fun Boy 3, Banana Rama, Elvis oh, Costello, wow. okay. Pretenders, uh, Boomtown Rats. I mean, it's, yeah. it was fantastic. And so I walk in there and there's a fantastic bloke called Nigel Sweeney who's right, who I'm working with. And, and Nigel and says, Nigel says to me, listen, the first record we're working on is, is New Year's Day from U2. Um, and, and the rest was history. And as a consequence of that and, and Clive, if I land up at Island Records, and I walk into Ireland and, and, and we start doing, let me have a think about this, Frank goes to Hollywood, um, Grace Jones, Slater Rhythm, Robert Palmer, Addicted to Love, uh, Steve Winwood, Julian Cope, The Christians, Joshua Tree from U2, you know, all the rest of it. Wow. So, yeah. um, and that was a great time for Island Records as well, especially yeah, in the 80s. You know. If you're going to work for a record label, that's the record label. Yeah. You know, Bob Marley Legend album. I mean, it was just... It was just it, 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 the, the the DNA of Ireland because of Chris Blackwell it was, it was so solid was so much it, you got the freedom to make musical decisions you were encouraged to go in the studio and help them make the records and, I, and one of my favourite things I was able to do while I was there was books by Sly and Robbie and, and I heard it as a thirty seven minute track and went I think there's a single in here. And so I spent a week, because it was taped in those days, editing yeah. this thing down to a three-minute, you know, bass, the final frontier, <laughs> um, and, and into a single. And we got it to number 12. And I remember seeing it on Top of the Pops. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. such an yeah. iconic performance. Well, oh, Slime no, Robbie, great... Slime Robbie Gods. Yeah, you know, They're gods of rhythm, gods yeah, of everything they absolutely. ever did. They're men of total integrity. And if you look at all the records they ever played on from all of Grace's stuff, so yeah. of course we did Iron on Life while I was sure. there as well with Grace, um, at all of those records they ever played on, there was an incredible integrity of those boys. The men, I should say, really. Yeah. Um, so it was a massive privilege. Um, and and, and, and I, I got to, I was 20, what was I, 23 when I had a promotion at Ireland. And I got, wow. to 20, I got to 27 and I always, 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 always wanted to be my own boss and start my own company. Uh, and I went to Clive, my, who was the managing director and, and my, you know, my guru, if you want to call it that. And I said, mate, I'm, I, I, you know, Sir Clive or whatever, I'm going to start my own company. And he went, are you sure about that? <laughs> and I went, yep, because I don't have a family, I don't have kids, I don't have responsibilities. If I don't do it now and I land up being lucky enough to have those things, it's probably going to be more difficult. And so I left in, I did Don't Turn Around, uh, or worked on Don't Turn Around for Rather Aswad. wonderful Aswad. Yeah. Um, and, 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 that, and left in February 88 to go start Gut Plugging Company, Gut Reaction, uh, and took the Christians with me as clients. And then obviously we landed up in the long run with, with uh, you know, it took a few years, but it, t- it took a while to get going. I mean, my first year of business was a fucking disaster. Um, because well, I very had, brave of you at that age as well to start up a label as well. Well, I was stupid. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I didn't start the label, and the label came a couple of years later. Right, but the, with the um, plugging company, but you, yeah, but, but I, you had the contacts, obviously. And, yeah, yeah, but I was stupid. I didn't, I didn't know how to run a business. So knowing how to do a job is one thing. Knowing how yeah, to run a business is a very, very different true. thing, Terry. Yeah, um, and I had to learn that process, and it took a while. Um, and I very luckily took Caroline, my assistant, with me, who became my business partner and my right hand person and my sister. I mean, I'm godfather to her daughter, and you know, oh, lovely. She, you know, she's one of the world's most special human beings. And without her, I couldn't have done it. To be blunt, Caroline, you know, came from a fantastic family, grew up on a council estate in Croydon and more balls than most people you'll ever meet in your life, more integrity than anyone I've ever known. And she was the piece I could lean on to, to get there. I couldn't have done it on my own. So, you know, I'm very lucky. 
So, you, so, so gut, gut reaction. Gut reaction, so. yeah. Initially, and then, yeah. so tell me how you discovered or who, how Right Said Fred came to you and tell us about the journey of I'm Too Sexy, the <laughs> album, and all the millions of sales. And... Oh, God. Um, well, it's a while ago. Um, I... There was this very, very attractive young lady who was working in reception at Red Bus Recording Studios. I don't know if you remember them. Imagination, wasn't yeah, it? Imagination that's, that's came out. Yeah, Imagination came out. Exactly. Yeah, no, I didn't work on them. Uh, and and I was doing some work on. Uh, I think it was. I can't remember now. Such a while ago. Doing some work with them on plugging a couple of, 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 of bits of music and so on for for things coming out of there. And I kept asking her out on a date, and she kept <laughs> looking at me, going, "No." <laughs> You're ugly. I was like, all right, I'll go away. Can you say that? No, don't, no, 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 I'm joking. Uh, and she's still a friend, so no, I don't mean that. Uh, anyway, so long story short, we'll end up taking her out for a drink one night, and I have a friend of mine, Boris uh, Fedor, we call him Boris because he's Russian, Fedor with me, who's sadly passed now, but a wonderful man. And um, uh, she proceeds, she's got Russian heritage, so all night they're talking bloody Russian this, Russian that, and Hang on, what's going on? So I say, well, I'll give you a lift home. And she goes, and we're in Listen Grove, and she lives in Harrow. And I'm like, oh, God, here we go. That's 45 minutes of my life gone. So I, I, she's sitting in the back of my car, and she leans through and puts a cassette in the cassette player. And Fedor starts singing it. And I'm like, hello, rewind. Oh, rewind. Oh, fucking terrible version, but that's a hit song. I mean, it was an awful version. And I was like... Okay, can I keep the cassette? And she said, I keep the cassette. I listened to it a few more times. Got up in the morning, listened to it again. And went, that needs to be a Madonna type dance record. Can I meet the people? Can I meet the band? The band come in. They look even fucking sillier than I thought they would. <laughs> and, 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 and I sat and I said, listen, you know, I think this needs to be a kind of danceable Madonna type record. <laughs> and, and they went, yeah, that's what we were thinking as well. I said, oh, great. We're on the same page. Well, let's make the record and I'll get you a recording deal. Because it's a smash. Yeah. So we go in, and there's a wonderful producer called Tommy Danvers, Tommy D. Tommy D, yeah. Uh, he yeah, produced yeah. it. He did a brilliant job. And Tommy, one of the world's lovely human beings. Fantastic bloke. And uh, Phil Spalding on bass, I remember, because I remember him playing Tommy D and me various bass lines and us going through it. And just, you know, it's just brilliant chemistry. And Tommy just gets a groove. Uh, and an arranger, he's a brilliant arranger. So um, he did a band with Jamie Scott, which was really good. Do you yeah, remember that? He's, that whole, he's had a pile of hits. Yeah, yeah, I'm he's sure, just yeah. a talent, talent, yeah. real talent. So um, and he did a bunch of stuff for me later on, and other other artists. Um, and so uh, they finished the record, and I'm like, "This is a smash." So I, I then offer it to four different record labels, and I get comments from "It's rubbish" to "We don't do that kind of music" to "Don't even get my phone call returned by one label." So I'm like. Fuck you. This is a hit. So I'm sitting trying to figure it out and trying to figure it out. Cause it, you know, when, and by the way, I'd already played it to a couple of DJs at Radio 1 and producers at Radio 1 and go, oh, that's great. So I know I'm going to get it played. Yeah, yeah. And I'm telling people this and they went, and I'm like, you know what? Fuck you. I'll do this myself. Good for you. And it came yeah. to me, do it yourself. Three words. And that, that inspiration, those types of inspiration, is always one or two, three words. That's it. It's all you need in life. And if you listen to it, it will guide you where you need to go. And it's happened, luckily, a few times in my life. And it just was, do it yourself. I was like, okay. Oh, how do I do that? Well, I didn't understand manufacturing. I didn't understand distribution. But I knew a man that did. And so I called him up and I went, I've got this record. And he went, well, send me a cassette, send me a cassette. He calls me back literally minutes later and goes, that's a smash. I went, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> and I did a distribution deal over the phone, shook his hand over the phone, good to go for six years. Yeah? And we put it out, it went like dynamite. Yeah, yeah. It literally went like dynamite. And then I had to figure out, you know, the, the, the course of events, how to make it happen. And it was me and Caroline and a, and a junior called Richard, lovely fella, who running a worldwide record label. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I look back at it now; it was, it was crazy, but in a lovely way, you know. Yeah. In, in good problems. Yeah, exactly. And what an amazing experience to be your first record and be such a big smash as well. Yeah, that. yeah. It went number one all over the world. Twenty-eight countries, three weeks at number one in America. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Very lucky. Very and lucky. then, so tell me. So we, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at my list over there. So mm. you 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 work with Aswad. You work with uh, Jimmy Somerville, Space. Um, Tears of Fear Sparks, who I really love. Yeah, so yeah, tell love me, uh, some of them either plug in or you signed them to well, your no, record plug -in, label. Plug in was very different. So uh, Nigel came and joined us, and I had a lovely, lovely man called Steve Tandy. So they built 
uh, Intermedia, right. which was our plugging division. So that looked at that kept U2, Janet Jackson, Jamiroquai, Garbage, Ash. I mean, I could carry on. Yeah, it was is a, a list amazing, was wonderful. Yeah. And they ran those companies, really, not me. And, and, and obviously, I own them, but I ran them. You know, they ran them, and they did an amazing job. And 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 we luckily, I think we were top dog for quite a minute. Yeah, um, longer than quite a minute, but yeah, which was good. And that freed me up to go and 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 and, and try and find music and and as an indie label, you know. You never have the cash that the majors have, exactly. and also had. Um, and we're had talking a, not like now. You know, they keep. There was more majors, and and, and it was harder for the indies as well. Yeah, so. you, had, you had to spend a lot more money to That's get to market. It. Yeah, than you do now. Um, so you had you had, you know you you'd have a commitment when you sign an artist. You'd be thinking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds. Because you had to make the albums and market them and do a proper job. And then you had to set them up internationally and you had to do all the pieces. So, you know, you start making videos at 50, 100 grand a go before you've blinked. You've done it. So it's a big commitment. And, and one I loved. I wouldn't give a minute of it back. And some we got right and some we fucked up. It's life. Um, and you've got to be prepared to, you know, go get it done. Um, and some of those moments were brilliant, some were a pain. Um, so know, tell me what it was like to work with the legend that is Tom Jones. He did the Reload album, which yeah, was uh, yeah. so many different cover songs yeah, that he uh, did. And 17 different tracks of memory. Yeah. Shows, about being 18, I think it was 17. Um, I have to say Tom was the most professional artist I ever, ever worked yeah, with. Yeah, he was I'm never sure. late, always on time. If you briefed him about what it was and what you were doing, he would bang on the minute, on the nose. Um, a ton of fun. I mean, we had a lot of fun making that record and going out. It was a really arduous process because to try and coordinate 17 tracks in 17 different studios in, I think, I can't remember, five, six, seven countries all around the world. And with all different featured with artists. Different featured yeah, artists. Yeah. So we had stuff going on in Sweden and France and America and everywhere. <laughs> and, and the budget the budget tripled. <laughs> so that gave me a little bit of moment well, it did. of concern. Con commercially did very oh, no, well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you don't know until you get there. That's true, And, yeah. and I, I do remember sitting at my desk having some moments of oh fuck i hope this works um and and then the cardigans burning down the house track landed in my office on a what well, yeah dat in those days and i remember playing it and crying because it was like oh my god i'm gonna hit yeah like the cardigans they were a yeah. great band yeah. talking heads big shout out to chris friends that's a oh, yeah, totally. fantastic band um but you know you, you, you the balls were on the line yeah, wow. and, and in the music business, unfortunately, whether you like it or not, you've got to fairly regularly do that um, because you you don't know. But I'd rather live that life than you know exactly. sit behind the bank counter and <laughs> get in at nine and then leave at five. Personally, <laughs> nothing wrong with doing that job, but it's not what I quickly talk about Aswad. So Aswad, we were talking about like you're saying the original massive, and the original, from, the you original know, and Labyrinth Road guys, massive, yeah. yeah. And so you you had Shine with yeah, that. That absolutely. was a number one song, and yeah. that was a fantastic song. I mean, yeah, I still yeah. play that all the time. And yeah, it's brilliant. You know, yeah. great guys. So, and also tell me about uh, where. The, you, so you were telling me you were you in the tsunami, and then about the crazy frog. So yeah, well, I made some fairly um, interestingly shit records as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> to be honest, they're not all cool. But the bank manager really liked that record. Um, so I was in 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 2004 caught up in a tsunami in Thailand, and it destroyed our hotel. So we were uh, caught there, and and the only news channel at the time was CNN. Um, and I didn't understand Thai, so I certainly couldn't watch Thai TV, unfortunately. And, and the only advert running was this ding, 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 ringtone advert. <laughs> and after being brainwashed for a few days by this advert, I woke up one morning with the extraordinarily stupid thought of, that would make a great record. And so uh, very luckily found some German fellas that, had, had, that, that, that were, wanted to get involved in it in the XLF piece. And, and um, then I came up with the idea that, I knew I was never going to get it played on the radio because it's not a radio record. It's, it's totally, it's, it's so far from cool that it's never going to get on radio. And any sudden, I still don't think it ever gets played, although it is the most played video on YouTube. It's got three billion views. Um, but wow. what we did was we bought our own servers and set it up pre-YouTube. And it had tens of millions of streams pre-YouTube because the technology had really just got there where you could show video online. And it, that's how we sold it. Wow, so impressive. Wow, I mean, I'm, I'm just so, you know, I'm just taken back with everything you've done and everything. So don't tell be, me don't what, be. It's so, guesswork, mate. So we're it's gonna, guesswork, trust me, it's guesswork. But, you know, yeah. you've been very it's, successful. It's a lot of this. And you're a lovely guy, so that, that's really, 
you know, inspiring when you meet someone that you really admire and that, you know, have successful yeah, careers really in fun. music and especially, and yeah, and you've mentioned how everyone's so lovely. So, you know, that, that's really great the to see, you know. work with people you like. Yeah. If someone absolutely. walks in your room and they're an asshole, they can work somewhere else. <laughs> Politely, they can just yeah. go work somewhere else. The yeah. beauty of, you know, I, I was always, I was referred to uh, by a few people as Marmite. Yeah. Because if I didn't like someone, I wasn't interested in working yeah. with them. There's well, no the amount of money way, that it? brings yeah. you what you want in life. You've got to do it for reasons that you care. It's the music business. It's not banking. You don't have to compromise. What you have to do is do what you love and what you believe in. And I have no qualifications. I have never succeeded in anything to do with education. I had nothing. Everyone told me I was an idiot. So that's fine. But if I can help make music and people happy with the music then that's fucking great yeah absolutely yeah? and absolutely. if you work with a few people that you get to build a rapport with that you like and you care about then you've done all right in life absolutely yeah? but it is but there are you know there are a lot of difficult people in the world and you do come across them you've got to know how to deal with them because you've got to be tough enough to deal with them but the key is don't do business with them if you can avoid it so I just want to, spread, before I wrap it up, with clusterview.com, Terry Topcat presents the wonderful Guy Holmes. Your advice and how different it is the music industry now to, like, uh, to aspiring musicians mm -hmm. and what you're doing now? Well, that's, that's two very different things. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Whichever order I, you want I to do. Don't let people tell you you can't do it. Do what you love. Get on with it. And if people say you can't do it, it's they can't do it, not you can't do it. Yeah? Everything I've ever been lucky enough to do in my life, someone's told me I couldn't do. It's not I couldn't do it, it's they couldn't do it. So if you believe in your music and you believe in what you're doing, do it. Get it done. Yeah? It's your life. No one else's. And how different is it? Would you think is it internet hindrance or no. a good help to... No. A, a, you know, it's new, always new been incredibly competitive. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's Absolutely. never going to be less competitive. Yeah. So it is what it is. Go and get it done. doesn't matter if it was yesterday or today. It's now. If you believe in your music and you've got that drive, that passion, that desire, you will make something happen. Brilliant. Yeah? Great advice. And, what, and just briefly, what are you doing now? Oh, crack it. Well, now I do venture capital. So I, I invest in tech companies and I've got all sorts of different companies. Well, five different companies I've invested in so far, but more coming um, and I look for hits in different businesses if you go it's still A&R in essence yeah. so I'm looking for great ideas um, I have a technology software company in America that's doing very well um, and it's really simple it's the same thing is there a hit song i.e. the idea and are the people executing it stars i.e. have they got the skills have they got the intelligence the integrity the passion the drive to go and get the it done. The work ethic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, passion is work. Yeah, absolutely. If passion yeah. drives you, then you're coming from the right place. You know, I, I, I was just sitting down with someone uh, just before this, and they were, well, we've got this going on and that going on, and I'm like, I'm sorry, you just sound like a checklist. <laughs> where's your passion? Where's the heart in what you want to do? Where's the, where's, the, where's, the, where's the real fire in this? He, oh, yeah, but we're doing, and we're doing AI. I went, well, do you know what AI is? He didn't. Bless him. Yeah? Because he's thinking about it, he's not feeling it. People buy things they feel good about. Absolutely. Yeah? And yeah. music is a feeling. You're in the business of selling feelings. Yeah. Thank you, Guy. Pleasure. It's been absolutely nice you, so Ray. much fun. And uh, yeah. neighbour. We'll yeah, exactly. Out a bit as well. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this has been Terry Topcat for Clusterview Presents with Guy Holmes.